Oleksiy Pasyuk, you are uh, talking to us from uh, Ukraine. What, what city are you in right now, or where are you? I'm uh, in Ivana Frankivsk, that's uh, Western Ukraine, and it's a uh, kind of regional center. Yeah, and but you you had to leave uh, Kiev a few. From Kiev, yes. Uh, we live in Kiev with our family, and uh, that was a pretty kind of fast decision. We, and it's a little bit interesting because we. Uh, have been preparing for the start of the war, looking into kind of the news which were coming from abroad. And we were very much focused on uh, preparing at work. So for our staff, doing training on how to treat wounds, uh, where we go, setting office somewhere else. But I think most of the people were hoping they will stay over occupation. And that was also our idea. But then we Basically, on the first day, we woke up from uh, bombing and it was like five o'clock in the morning and the kids got scared. How old are your children? Uh, my, my younger one is four. So the older one is 12, uh, the two daughters. And um, it was, I mean, that was one of the reasons. And I, I think many people... Uh, were preparing and uh, we were always discussing. So what is the time when you start you, to implement your kind of, uh, uh, plans, which you designed and um, kind of shelling was one of them. And once it happened, but my wife was hesitant to leave and we kind of started to pack just to fill the time, not to think because everybody immediately started to look news. And it was, uh, of course, very tense moment. And uh, yeah, so and of course, uh, immediately the roads got packed. And for many people, that was one of the reasons why they don't, didn't want to leave the city because uh, getting in traffic jam and staying on the roads. And also people, because in 2014, when similar situation started in Donetsk, many people who started to flee immediately got into shellings on the roads. So for some people were arguing you shouldn't do it now because then you get into the combat operation on the way. Yeah. So, so I think for you, the important thing was to have plans in place beforehand. And even with those plans, it's very hard when you're in the middle of all these things to know what is the real information, what is the false information, what should I act on, what should I not, not act on. Yeah, and there is, of course, a dilemma. What do you do? And I think for, for, for some of the people, uh, for example, the reason was uh, some uh, family members who, with disabilities or who is difficult to move and they thought, okay, we can probably stay through, through the thing. Uh, but uh, the, the, uh, I, I think what's happening is that maybe also most of the people expected that war will start somewhere in the east and uh, in the south and Kiev would be kind of a next step if Russians would proceed uh, successfully in the south, but Kyiv was immediately attacked. Um, uh, also, like, ground troops immediately moved towards uh, Kyiv. And still, many people stayed, and one of the difficulty which we faced that, you know, some of the people were saying, no, we stay, we want to be helpful here. But then it was very complicated because then they got stuck in the basement of their houses and you cannot be so much helpful anymore. And uh, then we started to face this problem, how to move the second phase and the third phase uh, waves, I would say, yeah. of people who, who didn't move immediately. Where you are now, uh, you feel that it is safe. You feel that you know it's unlikely that the war is going to come to you. Um, Yes, I I think so. I I mean, Ukraine is building really a lot of the lines of defense uh, to go in the West. And also for Russians, it would be so stupid to move into this direction because it's obviously they don't have support even in Russian-speaking cities. Uh, so in the Western Ukraine, they will not have uh, support. But uh, it was bombed on the first day. So there is a military air base and it was targeted already on the first day. And we have this plane, so just like five kilometers from here. And um, yeah, and of course now it becomes a big uh, spot for 
people who move from uh, from Kiev. Uh, some are stopping over to to move uh, abroad, but also many people want to stay here and they don't want to move abroad. And there is a pressure, of course, on the whole infrastructure on handling so many people. Sure, for sure. Speaking of that pressure, we're hearing uh, stories, I don't know if they're true or not, maybe you, you know more than me, about people uh, who may have been from Africa or Asia or wherever, who are not, uh, who are sort of being discriminated against um, in these evacuation processes and so on. Have you heard these stories? Is there any truth to this? Yes, uh, I think uh, it's, uh, there are individual cases. I also have like my friends uh, speaking of that, like for example, a group of Indians being taken to some town in Carpathians and said, okay, this is the border and left there and they got lost. Uh, however, I think it's kind of individual accidents and partly because of the language barrier and very tough stand on the authorities. For example, men are not allowed from the country. And of course, also borders are packed, there are big light lanes. And uh, it's not always that people are getting proper information on that. But uh, as the result, I think Partly what we got is that um, uh, people of color are afraid to leave because they're afraid what's on the border. And I was involved. I'm helping. I'm in contact with my European colleagues who are also taking care of this issue. And for example, I was helping to bring one Nigerian guy out of the country because here in one of Frontiers, it's an institute where a lot of foreigners study in oil and gas. And um, it was easy. I mean, there, there, were, there were no issues. It's like it took him one hour to go across the border. But uh, people are just afraid to ask random taxi drivers. So they, they want to, somebody to help them around. And also he, he uh, was reporting that uh, on the train station, we suggested that he live by train. And in the train station, there were um, uh, volunteers who spoke uh, English on the on Ukrainian side. So I think some people definitely got in the difficult situation, but I would not say it's a, a systematic. I also yeah. think uh, it's important that uh, on European side, they kind of um, uh, removed all these barriers on need of the documents, giving people maybe two weeks or so to figure out if they want to evacuate to their regional countries. So yes, I think I think it was important that it was flagged, but I also think there is a little bit of uh, kind of, of push on this topic, and I think uh, maybe overstated. Also. Yeah, yeah, I think there was a reaction. Basically, you have different people, but I think government was very clear that they don't want. Yeah. I mean, from what you have individuals, you know, I want to, I want to tell you there is even this kind of thing that towards uh, inside of the country towards men who live uh, uh, to to Western uh, Ukraine. Uh, I didn't experience it myself, but I see that some people would meet somebody in the villages. They would stop them uh, as they evacuate and say, "Why do you go to the West? You should stay in Kiev and defend it." Uh, from another hand, uh, the demand, uh, I think that the, the, there are more people who are ready to fight than there is uh, ability to um, kind of provide training and equipment. And also Ukraine had half a million veterans already because we're in war with Russia from 2014. And of course, it's a quite a base to, to fill the army. Yeah. So, so if you don't mind, well, a couple of things to, to just um, close out that discussion and then move to the next one. So what I'm hearing is that um, as far as you're aware, there's no systemic or systematic discrimination or racial dis discrimination, but there's a lot of confusion. And in that confusion, it may be the case that individuals are experiencing individual acts of racism. In fact, you're pretty sure that that's happening, yeah. but it's not a systematic. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. So, so I want to move from there to the question of what can the international community do? So, um, yeah, if you have any thoughts on that. Well, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a difficult one, especially, I think, for the kind of um, 
pacifist community and uh, uh, social justice community because it's by by default we are kind of anti-war and I consider myself being part of it. But I think there are so many, uh, including me, re reconsidering where we are and uh, what it all means and um, and how we deal with that because. Uh, I still sometimes hear from some people who are saying we, we should use diplomacy. But I think there was such a huge diplomatic effort to prevent this from happening. And obviously you have to have some common grounds to have any kind of discussion. And I think uh, Russia, Russia uh, Putin's Russia basically, yes. represent uh, a state where the common value are not their values. So there is no value yeah. of, the, of the human life, of uh, freedom. <laughs> I mean, what yeah. kind of freedom you're talking yeah. about? You, you don't Can see I, that uh, yeah. human life has a value. No, for sure. In that sense, I think it's uh, um, for us it's important that there is also military support is happening to Ukraine in the sense of uh, equipment and whatever. If it's uh, it's understandable that NATO don't want to get into direct kind of uh, fighting with Russia. Okay, that's clear. But I think uh, helping Ukraine to do also military defense is extremely important. If I play devil's advocate, what I can say is that, look, um, there were governments, including the one that was overthrown, or the, the one after, the, the one that was re replacing the pro-Russian government that was overthrown in 2014. Um, I think I have that history right. W that that, um, that were talking about Ukraine sort of openly joining N NATO, which Russia was never going to accept. Um, and it's, it's not clear, in, when you talk about those diplomatic efforts, at least from what I, I'm reading, conflicting things was Ukraine was the current Ukrainian government willing to take NATO membership off of the table, or, or what was what? Did, do you know the answer to that question, or were they? Because I think that's Russia's main main concern, or one of Russia's main concerns. No, I don't think it's. Uh, I think they sell it like that, but no. you cannot seriously conceive the countries which are bordering Russia to join NATO, to attack NATO, like Lit Lithuania, Estonia, all these Baltic states. I mean, that's not an intention to, for them to go to Russia and to have fight there. there this is, uh, yes, uh, I think uh, both in 2004, I, I think any Ukrainian government will kind of run NATO. What happened in 2014 is that uh, even pro-Russian government was ready to sign association agreement with the EU. And that's where the whole thing started uh, when Russia said it's too much. So it was not even about military. And the uh, Ukraine the was, yeah, Ukraine was clearly said, uh, told back in 2004 that probably you will not get that. So after the Orange Revolution, if you remember that. Yeah, of course. So uh, there is a always kind of proclaimed wish to get to NATO, but I don't think there was any active move to, uh, towards that. I think uh, for Russia, it's uh, a little bit different. I think uh, they, they wanted to be kind of here to clearly that they are internationally recognized player. And I think everybody was focused on China and they felt lost. But I think there is also the whole historical story with Ukraine, which they consider non-existent country and which they keep proclaiming. They say, this is part of Russia. That's always was part of Russia. So NATO, I think, is a secondary thing for us. They, they, that's, of course, a um, uh, kind of useful rhetoric, uh, especially inside of the country. They really yeah. believe that they are being threaded. And it's just they're this kind of saying, if we will not attack, we will be attacked next day or something like that, which yeah. is uh, obvious. I mean, this is what any invader does. Sense. I mean, this is, what, this is what the U.S. did in Afghanistan and Iraq. This is what any... Any invader says that we're we're uh, you know we're using self defense. Yeah, but I think there is a little bit different history in the sense that uh, Russia is colonial country and they consider this to be their colony and they I mean 
uh, in Crimea, all business was controlled by Russian uh, businesses and it was not enough. So they want this type of empire where you have your food physically and where you want people to speak your language, not kind of neo-colonialism of uh, economic impact. They wanted to be effectively part of, of the state and uh, to have a full control and yeah, even on the level of language and culture. Yeah, this is kind of scary because what you're saying is that we, they want the, the, the current um, regime in Moscow uh, wants to go back to the days of, of, not days of Stalin necessarily, but days of Tsar. Is, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, not exactly. I think this is a history, but uh, uh, you can try to look. There are some uh, good articles which are saying that it's basically wrong to try to interpret P Putin as somebody who is trying to build something old. No, he wants to build a new world, a multi-vectoral kind of thing, and Ukraine is a kind of small part of it. We, we also always... Uh, uh, kind of looking it on that on perspective that uh, for Putin and for Russian audience, it's important to see that uh, Ukraine fails as the state economically and politically in a sense that you cannot, people shouldn't uh, demand kind of uh, to be in power. If you, if, you, if you have a democracy, you fail. So this is one of the things they want to see. But yes, I think that's what I buy is that Putin has his idea of a new world. Yeah, fair um, enough. Yeah. Another part of the Russian rhetoric that may or may not have any truth to it is that they are conducting sort of anti-fascist uh, campaigns in Ukraine. Um, and, and I think there has been a rise of the neo-fascist, neo-Nazi movements, not just in Ukraine, but in Europe, over the past 10, 15, 20 years more generally. Yeah, but not in Ukraine. Not in Ukraine. No. I think this is exactly an opposite which we have. So when we, when we had a pro-Russian government which moved, we had a 10%, it was the main opposition party of 10% in the parliament, which was kind of uh, nationalistic in a way. But after Euromaidan, uh, Euro yes, yeah, we call it, so when the pro-Russian president ran away, um, Maidan was not run by nationalists, and I think this is misconception brought by Russia. It was like everyone from a gay community, you know, doing the whole thing. And after Euromaidan, when we had elections, none of the nationalist parties did it to the parliament. So they couldn't, uh, they were getting like uh, 3% or something. So they couldn't make a 5% barrier. And also, People who were going for president, the uh, the nationalists, they were getting like one and a half percent of the. Yeah. Oh, so this is a completely false yeah. uh, kind of. So if approach. I understand you correctly, there, there. I mean, what, what? Again, to play devil's advocate, what someone may say is that there are photographs of Ukrainian military and paramilitary troopers who have sort of neo-Nazi symbols, etc. So there may be some individuals who have who are there, but it's not necessarily, they don't have the political power in the sense that they may have had 10 years ago. Yes, even at Maidan, uh, they, they, they would be, I mean, it's a nice guys to make pictures of. So they're kind of organized, they, they have some certain image, but it's not who, who make the base of it. So I think there is, I will tell you more. I think there is even misconception about Crimea. And if you would, uh, Ukraine was uh, kind of uh, quite open in terms of elections. Uh, I mean, there are other problems, of course, of the political system, but elections were uh, open for, for many years. And then Crimea, just before, uh, just before us, uh, how you call it, annexation by Russia, there were elections and there was a party which was openly calling to leave Ukraine and join Russia. And they were also getting like less than 5% of votes. So even if you would argue, okay, there were uh, pro-Russian, especially in the cities and Sevastopol, where there was always Russian military, uh, it still was not widespread. It was not considered as a serious move, you know. So, and I think these uh, elections are very clear examples of those. Yeah. 
So what you're saying is that um, despite whatever rhetoric you're hearing, the fact is that these groups, both the pro-Russia groups and the sort of far-right nationalist groups, don't really have any political power as measured in in the in the ballot box. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we can go through the whole thing of political parties, but it's complicated. It's uh, because most of the parties are not kind of don't have political programs. You cannot clearly put them on the spectrum. They are basically run by individuals, except of leftist and rightist. Those have a very clear kind of political. Policies. I see. I see. So, so listen. You and I have met. Uh, we haven't actually met in Ukraine, unfortunately, but we've met in in Russia. We've met in Moscow, and maybe in Saint Petersburg as well. I'm not remembering. Um, so, uh, our friends in in Russia who are probably against this war, uh, is they're putting themselves in a bit of a dangerous place right now, isn't it? I see protest is continuing, but there are anti-protest laws that are coming. What do you think? Uh, what do you think is going on in Russia? Oh, I think I agree. Then a uh, difficult situation. And you know what? One of the difficulty which we now face is uh, the Ukrainian public is turning much a lot against Russians uh, in general. And uh, it's extremely difficult to convince in this situation that uh, there are activists who are anti-war, I think uh, uh, Russians would need to, will be put by Ukrainians to have a collective, how you call it, uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, I mean, there is, you, you can see a lot of like uh, this uh, pictures, how Russians running away from police while Ukrainians stopping tanks with bare hands. And I guess it's uh, not very fair uh, because I know lots of Russians who I have a lot of sympathies and I also understand how difficult for them is to handle. And I also clearly understand that many Ukrainians like myself, if like Euromaidan would not win, we might be living in a country which is similar to Russia and we would not like to be treated as responsible for what the government is doing. Um, so... I don't know what even uh, to say for that, uh, to, about that, because uh, Ukrainians are very much looking forward to see Russian kind of appraisal and people going out. But unfortunately, like all pools are showing the massive support to the state, which is, of course, a result of propaganda. But also, if, we, if you talk to Ukrainians, we have relatives in Russia. And you, you can talk to your close relatives and they just... Um, don't want to expect the reality. They say it's all stage, it's not real, it's you are bombing yourself, more or less. It's people who are Ukrainians who live uh, in Russia. So it's very difficult. I think it's partly a uh, kind of uh, psychological uh, approach because imagine yourself in a country where you realize that the whole system where you live is just like in this 1984 the Ministry of Lie, of Truth, right? And all that. If you suddenly realize that's where you lie, it should be very depressing for people. So I think they prefer to live in a propaganda machine. Otherwise, what you do, you go and kill yourself. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, Alexei Pasiuk, it's been a pleasure. Before we leave, uh, do you have any, any thoughts on um, how, how this ends? What's the future hold? I mean, you have two young children. What does the future hold yeah. for that? I, you know, after 2014, I don't uh, have any forecasts anymore because I think what happened in Ukraine then, it's like every next step was unbelievable. So, and uh, unreal things actually happen. So I think there's so many scenarios of what uh, what can be done. We, we all live, of course, with hope that it uh, finishes soon. But I think the starting points uh, for diplomacy are so far one from another. Uh, Russia wants like uh, Crimea to be accepted as Russian and all that. And the Ukrainian public would not support it even if politicians sign a deal. So... It's uh, too complicated. I think uh, it, what will need to happen is that uh, Russia start to feel sanctions because now it's still on, on paper and it will have an impact in a little while. 
and and then we would need to see how long they're able to stay against it. Cool. Thank you so much. Yes, it was a pleasure to meet you. So thank you for thinking of us. I think no, uh, for Ukrainians, it's very important also that so much support is getting from uh, from Europe in terms of humanitarian. And we hope that it will that military at least defense of what will continue. Yeah, no, and, and I think one thing that we can all agree is that uh, you know war is. Um, I mean, it's the last thing anyone wants. Uh, but now that it's it started, uh, we hope that there is a just and peaceful solution as quickly as possible. Keeping in mind that many of the players don't seem to be rational, so we hope that cooler heads will prevail. Yeah, yeah. 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 Anything else you want to say, Alexi? No, I want to say thanks for support, and we count on you as well. No, thanks, and Ukrainians too, whatever they can to to stop it.